show and here need to understand that until you own the mortgage company that holds the mortgage on your house, till you own the finance company that you have notes on your car and pay to, until you own the insurance company that insures your car, you're not even in the game. You're just kidding yourself as you run up and down the Dan Ryan uh, I-57 or that you go up and down Madison or Pulaski or wherever you drive, that those other people who come to work at 9 or 10 o'clock because you've been there since 8.30 or 7.30, because you, like Dick Gregory used to say, have gone somewhere to be worked, and you're not going to work. The people who are going to work come at 9 or 10 o'clock and, and work sometimes just till 2, and then they go home. But they leave you there being worked. And earlier we had talked before we were on the air about who controls black people's thought patterns. And in the warm up, Brother Omar Wali made some points that didn't go out on the air about how white people, white organizations, especially secret organizations, go about the business of controlling the minds of black people. Well, when I see you, myself included, because I don't have any place else to go, going in a Walgreens drugstore, you see that's basically the only drugstore available to go in, or ISCO, or some other drugstore owned by white people, in this case talking about Walgreens, Jewish people sell all kind of Christmas ornaments, every kind of junk that they can sell to black folk, and that's a Jewish organization. Now, if Walgreens is a Jewish organization, then we know one thing is that Jewish people do not believe in Christmas, they observe Hanukkah. They certainly don't believe in Jesus. But I contend again that 90% of the black people who work in Walgreens believe in Jesus. In fact, that's one of the things that's intimated in the interview is, are you a good Christian? You know, why would a Jew ask a black person whether they're a good Christian? Think of it. See, I'm trying to put something on your mind, because if we get out of this, it's because you understand that you are going to have to, after you have come back from the two million man march, you see, they keep billing it as the million man march. And when Farrakhan first advanced the idea, he was really skeptical as to whether he was going to get a million there. Well, there are people in this audience that I happen to know were on that march, and so they can attest to the fact, excuse me, attest to the fact that there were certainly two million, and my being very familiar with Washington, it had to be two and a half million people there. And these were black men, basically, although there were any number of black females there. Now, in the spirit of the Million Man March, which was about atonement from not being able to take care of your own, take care of your own child, take care of your own woman, your wife, the mother of your children. Black men have not been doing this. And those who are doing it are not doing it as well as they could be if they understood some things about economics, if they understood the difference between money and wealth, and how you acquire wealth if you have money. 
we are aware that black people have somewhere between 350 to 450 billion dollars. That's more money than most countries in the world have. But they don't have any gross national product. And what we're talking about is how to get into the ownership of those institutions that manufacture wealth. You see, insurance companies, banks, savings and loans, credit unions, they create wealth. Wealth is what it takes to hire people. And we have a few black financial institutions like Illinois Service Federal as a savings and loan, as Seaway Bank, Lyondale Community Bank, and a few others in Chicago. But I would guarantee you that black people in Chicago only have less than 1% of the money that they handle in black institutions. Did you hear that? Less than 1%. Why? It's because black people have let white folks take over their minds. And therefore, they don't believe that it's in their best interest to invest in black enterprises. Most black people do not shop at Chatham Foods or at um, uh, the food basket, black owned, have the exact same canned goods, the exact same vegetables that Jewel and Dominic's have. Why is it that it's difficult to get black people to go to Chatham Food or the food basket? And sister over on the west side with pride is just about to go out of business if she don't get some more people to come in. Why? She's selling the same camel's pork and beans. She's selling the same uh, bread, wholesome bread. She's selling the exact same things. And I will tell you a little secret that the food basket at 87th and King Drive, they have one grade higher meats than is sold at Dominic and Jewel. And black folks claim that they want the best, but they don't want the best if black people are selling it. That's, that's really weird. You, you think about that. I, ha I have to, do, to go all out of my way to try to get to 87th and King Drive because I don't own a car anymore. All I'm saying to you is that we have got to do some things, and I'm not talking about a new idea. Let me read you something. This is from, of course, Lerone Bennett's A History of Black America. The name of the book is Before the Mayflower. The energies, I'm quoting, the energies flowing from these figures and forces fused in 1898, repeating, 1898, at the fourth annual Atlanta University Conference on the Negro in Business. In his Keystone keynote address, John Hope, the future president of Morehouse College, said, the salvation of black America depended to a great extent on the development of a business class. Now, he said that in 1898. And we haven't understood it in 1995.